All right. Got it. So, Ali, you'll have to be the one that uh, mutes folks. I can do that. Ali, if you could let me uh, share my screen. You should be good now, Steve. I've given you a co-host. Hello, folks. Um, we'll uh, give a few more uh, minutes here, maybe a minute or two before we get started. Let people that uh, want to join, uh, join. So uh, thank you for uh, joining us this evening. Okay, what do you uh, give up about uh, 632 and get started? Okay. All right, it's uh, 6.32 and I, uh, I want to thank everybody uh, for spending your evening with us. Hope you're somewhere cool near the water or, or what have you, hopefully uh, near a lake, an inland lake. My name is uh, Steve Largent and I serve as a conservation team coordinator here for the Grand Traverse Conservation District. I'm a biologist and I've been here for, uh, for 30 years, so uh, it's been a blessing. Uh, what we're going to be doing this evening is asking you to put your questions in the chat box. Uh, we will get to those after the presentation. And uh, this evening's event, the most unwanted aquatic invasive species, identifying, decontaminating, and reporting uh, of invasive spe aquatic invasive species. And this presentation is being given by Emily Cook, uh, Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator for the Benzie Conservation District. This is a continuation of a virtual education and informational series for those living out recreating in our local lakes and waterways. This was uh, developed by Friends of Spider Lake and Friends of Rennie Lake. The organizers is uh, Kara Kusel and Ralph Bednarz. And the Grand Traverse Conservation District has been hosting these events. Um, let's see. Uh, you can uh, go on our website, natureiscalling.org, and uh, 
Here's the, uh, I'll put this in the chat box as well, this link, but it's natureiscalling.org, polls series, and um, you can look at all the previous um, uh, recordings for Protect Our Lakes and Shorelands webinars uh, by clicking on one of these titles. Uh, Hands-on management of shoreline invasives, a dip into the hidden world of algae, ice, wind, and waves, protecting Michigan's inland lake and shorelines and shorelands, inland lake fish habitats and fisheries in a changing environment. And lastly, aquatic plants, uh, Michigan's underwater, underwater forests. So visit our website and uh, click on the poll series and you can view any of these. Also, I'd like to put a, a little shout out to uh, something that we're going to be doing on uh, June 22nd. Uh, Bugs Don't Bug Me. It's a macro invertebrate survey as part of our community science here at the Borden River Nature Center. And that is Wednesday, June 22nd from 12 to 2 p.m. Uh, and it'll be broken down into a series of stages, uh, as you can see. But uh, feel free, again, when you go onto our website, if you're interested, and sign up for that community science uh, 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 class. So for more information and, and to register, natureiscalling.org slash events. So I'd like to introduce uh, Ralph Bednars. Uh, Ralph is a retired MDEQ in 2011 after a 35 year career with the Enviro Environmental Protection and Water Resources Management Michigan. Uh, Ralph uh, is uh, three months after retiring, Ralph came back to the DEQ Water Resources Division as a US uh, EPA Senior Environmental Employment Program Specialist to coordinate the implementation of the 2012 National Lakes Assessment in Michigan. He also served as a national trainer for the 2012 National Lake Assessment. So Ralph, <clears throat> excuse me, Ralph managed the DEQ's inland lakes water quality monitoring programs, including the Lake Water Quality and Assessment Monitoring Program and the Cooperative Lakes Monitoring Program. He was a responsible responsible for the implementation of the 2007 and 2012 National Lake Assessment in Michigan. He coordinated the development and implementation of the Michigan Clean Water Corps Volunteer Water Monitoring Network. Ralph currently stays involved with protective lakes management programs in Michigan through the Michigan Inland Lakes Partnership, the Michigan Nat Natural Shoreline Partnership, and McNalms. Ralph is working to protect Michigan inland lakes in the Traverse City area, one lake, one shoreline at a time by assisting and educating local units of government and lake associations on protective inland lakes management. Ralph has a <clears throat> BS in biology, chemistry from the University of Illinois and an MS in limnology from Michigan State University. Ralph. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, that, that was a, a nice, nice uh, introduction. Uh, not, not needed, but very nice. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, thank you all for participating in the uh, fourth annual Protecting Our Inland Lakes and Shorelands series, the Poll series. Polls was started by the Friends of Spider Lake, Carol Kusel and Patty Herzberger in 2019 and was held as in-person events at a facility on Rennie Lake near Traverse City, Michigan. I joined the Poles team in 2020, and we partnered with the Grand Traverse Conservation District to host the Pole series the last two years as virtual lunch and learn events. We have been able to bring to the local community some very knowledgeable and interesting speakers on various aspects of lake and lakeshore ecology, best management practices, and threats. As Steve mentioned, the 2020 and 2021 presentations were recorded and are available on the Grand Traverse Conservation District website. We made the decision this year to move polls to an evening virtual event and reach out to a local expert to talk about a very important topic that is impacting our lakes and streams, aquatic invasive species, otherwise known as AIS. Tonight's speaker is Emily Cook. Emily is currently the AIS coordinator at the Benzie Conservation District and manager of the Aquatic Invasive Species Pathways Program. She previously worked as outreach specialist for the Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network. Emily holds a degree in natural resources management from Grand Valley State University. Emily, welcome and thank you for continuing the 2022 poll series with the most unwanted aquatic invasive species, identifying, decontaminating, and reporting. Emily, the virtual stage is yours. <laughs> thank you, Ralph. Let me get my own screen going here. 
<clears throat> How's that look to everyone? Looks okay? Looks good. Okay. I mean, two and a half years later, I still don't trust that ScreenShare is doing what it's supposed to be doing. So I appreciate the confirmation. Um, thanks, Ralph, again for that introduction. My name is Emily Cook. I am the Aquatic Invasive Species Coordinator at Benzie Conservation District. I'm grateful you're here on this super hot evening in Michigan. I wasn't sure if folks would be up for being on a webinar or trying to get in the water somewhere. So it's nice to see all of you here. Um, before we dive in, I'm actually going to throw up a few poll questions um, because I'd like to get an idea of the audience here tonight and what your background is with AIS and kind of what your main concerns are. So I'm going to get those going here. And Allie, I might have to have you do that since I'm in um, the mode that I'm in. I can't see those. All that right. The poll is up. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, so just take a, a few seconds here to throw in your answer. Very low pressure test for you at the beginning of this presentation. Okay, so everyone has answered. Um, so it looks like most people here are shoreline property owners. That's three quarters of you. Some people have a general interest in invasive species. And then we have a few more that are just generally passionate about environmental issues. Great, thank you so much. Do you wanna do the next one? Do, do, do. Um, the existing knowledge or causes for concern. Um, existing knowledge would be great. Stop. <clears throat> oh, gosh, you guys are super quick with this one. Okay, so. Oh, wow. So this is great. Um, so a lot of people are new that six people and then um, about half um, have a moderate knowledge of invasive species. And we even have one expert on our hands. <laughs> Perfect. This this helps me a lot going forward. So, you know, it's, it's nice to know how to kind of gear my language to the audience. So I appreciate you answering that. And we have one final one before I dive in. So this one's a multiple choice. It's hard to choose, especially if you're familiar with invasive species, what might be your um, most hated or least wanted. But if you could pick a handful here, that would be great. <clears throat> I think that's enough there. Uh, I think, that's yeah, good. that's pretty good. All right, so this one I'm going to share just because I think it's pretty fascinating. So the whole group should be able to see this. Um, uh, Emily, I don't think that you can. So I'll just share with you more than half of the group is concerned about zebra mussels as well as Eurasian water milfoil. Um, some other popular choices are Didymo, invasive carp, um, and then the European frog bit. All right, well, we'll be talking about all of those. So that's perfect. Okay, thank you so much, Allie. Thank you. All right, so getting into this, um, the title is The Most Unwanted Aquatic Invasive Species, Identifying, Decontaminating, and Reporting. So I'll be going um, basically over, you know, a little bit about my program, diving into what an invasive species actually is, how would you define that if you're new to this, this world of, of, of ecology, 
um, the process for making sure you're not spreading them and then how to report them if you happen to come across them um, out in the field out recreating. So, all right, so my program, the Aquatic Invasive Species Pathways, Pathways Program, we are based out of the Bunty Conservation District um, and we're pretty much a grant funded program. Um, not, not all of it, but I'd say 85% of it is grant funded. And originally it was just based out of Benzi, which makes perfect sense because of the conservation district it's in. Um, but however, with the a recent grant we received in 2019, it actually spread to some neighboring counties as well. So Grand Travers, Lelona, and Manistee as well. And essentially, uh, I'll be going into more detail about this later on, but we work to reduce the transfer of aquatic species. So making sure they're not moving from water body to water body, and then also just doing general AIS outreach and education. It's a huge component of uh, stopping the spread of invasive species is just making people aware of them because often um, it's just that lack of knowledge that's um, making people not stop and think about what they could be moving from place to place. So we primarily do that work through mobile boat washing. Um, like I said, the outreach and education, we do public presentations like this. We also attend community events, um, trying to hit as many different demographics as possible, whether it's people who fish or um, go out on ski boats or pontoon boats or kayakers, um, or even people who are going out in waders and, and anglers and of that sort. There's quite a broad spectrum of individuals we'll talk to. Um, we used to do some uh, more in-depth surveys, uh, lake monitoring, not so much anymore that split off to the, another part of the district, um, but we still participate sometimes. And, and on the right there, you can see our main funding sources at the moment. Um, our main funding is through the Michigan Invasive Species Grant Program, but I definitely wanna give a shout out to some of the others there who've certainly contributed a, a lot to the program. And then also some of our local municipalities have chipped in as well, which is, is a huge help. So these next few slides are just pretty pictures. And I want you to take a, a quick moment and think about whether you would consider it a healthy habitat. So this is um, a riverscape. It's a local riverscape. You might recognize where this is. I'll talk about that in a second. Of course, the iconic view of the Sleeping Bear Dunes and Lake Michigan. We have this view, another ecosystem with a shoreline. Think about whether you would consider that healthy and I'm thinking most of you will, will have a pretty solid answer for this one. Whoops. And then this last one, um, do you think this is a healthy ecosystem? Um, you know, it's a, it's a lake with an adjoining wetland with vegetation and a lot of pretty flowers. Um, and moving on from there, how would we even define a healthy ecosystem? So essentially it's when the native organisms that live in that environment are all balanced, they're in equilibrium. So the official definition is up there, the physical, biological, and chemical properties are all in equilibrium. So it's allowing those organisms to exist as they should be. Um, and these ecosystems can be impacted in, in a multitude of ways. Uh, there's a few listed here. So of course, nutrient pollution, that's one many people are aware of. So if you have, you know, runoff from a farm going into a waterway or you're in a community where there's some urban runoff that can really contribute to nutrient pollution, often in the form of algal blooms. Um, you often hear about that, especially um, in the warmer months when that runoff is a bit more, um, is happening more often. Of course, aquatic invasive species, what this presentation is about, and then uh, just pure habitat loss and destruction. Um, and it's important to point out that you can't always see on the surface level whether an environment is healthy, quote unquote, um, especially in the world of water, um, things are below the surface. And, and unless you do water quality tests, sometimes you'll think, oh, that's a murky pond. It doesn't look very good, but it actually could have a significantly higher water quality than a crystal clear lake. So it just really depends on what you're studying. So I'm gonna quickly go back over those pictures, knowing that definition now. And so this first picture is of the Manistee River in Manistee County. It's one of my favorite 
um, places to explore. And this is, in, at least in this location, is a pretty healthy ecosystem. Um, we know this from the fisheries that are there. There's not a lot of invasive species in, in this stretch. Um, if you look at the shoreline, there's no invasive species, at least that I can see in this image, that are, are crowding on any native species. Now, this one is a little trickier. Um, of course, it's a beautiful image, and Lake Michigan generally is, is, a, is a pretty healthy lake, but we also know there's a lot of invasive species in Lake Michigan. Um, and I'll be talking about some of them. So again, you can't always see, you know, there's a lot lurking beneath the surface that could affect whether we consider this a, an environment that was in that equilibrium. This one just doesn't look that great and it kind of gave it away, but most of you will be familiar that this is a shoreline that's just infested with invasive Phragmites, which we have unfortunately all over the place. Um, not as bad, badly anymore in Northwest Michigan, but we do have a lot of this shoreline um, I guess I'd call it more of a transitional species rather than a pure aquatic because it does it doesn't like too deep water and it'll just be on the shorelines. But um, this is this is a an unhealthy shoreline certainly. And this one, uh, many people will be familiar with the purple plant. That this is invasive purple loosestrife. Um, and I threw this image in because. If you weren't quite sure what that was, you might think this is a, a beautiful landscape, and it is. Um, you know, I personally think purple loosestrife is a, is a stunning flower. It's there's no purple quite like it, but unfortunately, like many invasives, it comes in, it takes over, and becomes this really dense monoculture, and, and it too affects that ecosystem quite drastically. So I wouldn't consider this um, environment to be the healthiest either. In this picture um, on this slide I already shared, this is a Eurasian water milfoil. Of course, you can see that, but again, it's, it's also sometimes hard to spot right from the surface. And when we talk about a healthy ecosystem, we want to support certain things in, in the wildlife and the organisms that live there. You know, from a selfish standpoint, we want to be able to explore it. We live in Northwest Michigan for a reason, and, and you know, getting out in our waterways is a, is a big part of exploring. So how, having a really aesthetically pleasing um, experience and then also not having to paddle through invasive vegetation is of course um, a benefit there, but also trying to support, um, you know, the, the beautiful native plants. This is a blue flag iris, a native wetland plant. Our bird populations, we have so many incredible species of birds that rely on healthy waterways here. Um, other animals, river otters, if you're fortunate to be paddling down a river and spot a family of otters, that's such a treat and they definitely prefer and you're going to find them in the really healthy um, ecosystems. The fish population is so, so critical um, and you can really tell, you know, Fish are really good indicators of the health of an ecosystem as well. Right there with the insects, which I'll be talking a little bit more about um, their importance for indicating healthy water as well. But ultimately trying to support this really diverse um, web of life that's within various types of water bodies, whether it's a, a pond or a stream or river all the way up to our, our lakes and our you know, Great Lakes. So I always think in these presentations, it's important to define what an invasive species is because sometimes that can be a little bit blurry. So whether you're talking about aquatic invasive species or invasive species that you would find on land, the definition is essentially the same. It's an organism from another part of the world that was introduced that causes harm to the environment, the economy, or people. Now, they can be introduced intentionally or accidentally. Um, you know, rarely is somebody introducing something maliciously because they know it's invasive and um, they, they want to wreak havoc on the environment, you know, that might be the result, but it's often just like, oh, I see this really pretty um, aquatic plant. I wonder, you know, I'm gonna bring this home and see how it does in my, my own backyard and my own lake that I live on and suddenly it starts to take over. A lot of things are just accidental, whether it's moved by people, or you know, in ballast water that's been moved all the way from Europe, that's how a lot of things are brought here. Um, and then in 
what they're called aquatic hitchhikers for a reason, they're unknowingly moved from place to place, which is why we're trying to stop that spread. And ultimately, invasive species, they upset that ecological stability, that balance that I talked about. They, you know, if you're talking about plants, they grow a lot bigger and a lot faster and a lot thicker than a lot of the native species, making it really easy for them to outcompete those natives. Um, and that, of course, in turn affects the insects that rely on them, the fish that would rely on that habitat. And you can kind of see how um, that web would collapse from there. Um, if, you're, if you're looking at animal species or like crustaceans um, of the sort, you know, things that can eat and take over entire habitats because they're voracious eaters and there's no food supply left for other species. Um, if, you, if you introduce a, an organism that is so prolific that it can take over whether it eats or grows bigger or stronger, you can start to see how that could affect everything else that should be technically um, existing in those environments. Um, the water quality can be impacted. It, you know, really thick, dense mats of vegetation can actually affect the sunlight coming into waterways and affect the oxygen. Um, a lot of these uh, species will actually, if you have a, a big source of nutrients runoff coming into, say, a, a lake or a river, um, they'll get quite big from that. And so paying attention to the water quality in that sense. And then, of course, we always kind of loop it around to ourselves as people who enjoy these areas that really de degrades the aesthetics when you have invasive species. And some invasives actually can decrease property values. There's been some studies done um, that show that the presence of certain species will make it uh, a little more challenging to sell your lake property if that is your goal. So in the Great Lakes region, there are um, about 180 species of aquatic invasives. Um, and that's a lot. I will not be talking about 180 species today, I promise. Um, but the management of these organisms is also very expensive. So in the state of Michigan alone, you can see that number there, it's about $100 million. Um, and that is, you know, identifying these species, actually going out and treating them, prevention campaigns, things of the sort. Um, if you look nationally, that number is just explodes and that's up to $9 billion. And um, I, it's kind of astounding because I, in my previous position, talked pretty much about terrestrial plants exclusively. So plants that are on land um, and those invasive species. And that was a whole other category that alone was billions of dollars. So when you tack on um, aquatics and put those numbers together, it's really astounding how much money is spent on managing these and you can really get a big picture of, of the impact that they have. But you can see, um, you know, invasive species almost always outcompete the native species, creating these really dense monocultures, um, especially in the case of plants. And I'll talk more about how the uh, other organisms have an impact. But essentially, like I mentioned, they're making those areas much less ecologically diverse and upsetting that balance. Um, and we're working to try and reverse that wherever we can. Again, I'm gonna loop this around to invasive Phragmites. That's that shoreline picture I showed. Um, it's a really tall grass that can be about 10 or 12 feet tall, it spreads incredibly quickly. It pushes out all of the native species on that shoreline. Um, which often on the shoreline is really important habitat for fish who would be laying eggs. So you can see how it could affect that as well. And this is the species that also can decrease property value. Um, and there was a study done uh, recently that also showed it is quite a significant um, fire hazard, which plays into that as well once the stalks dry out, like you can see in this picture. So how do invasive species get here? Many ways, unfortunately, that's part of the battle of, um, of managing them. So they can come through international shipping, again, usually on accident, um, in ballast water, like I mentioned, physically attached to um, the sides of ships, things of the sort. Um, the aquarium industry is a big, um, form of introduction. So I'm actually giving a little shout out to another group through MSU Extension called Ripple, which works to reduce invasive pet and plant escapes. 
um, essentially trying to educate folks who might be sick of their aquarium plants and animals, um, to encouraging them to not just go to the nearby uh, lake or river and dumping the organisms they no, no, no longer want. Because believe it or not, that's quite a significant issue. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard about the giant goldfish that had been found um, because somebody didn't want their pet goldfish anymore and just released it. Um, and the same goes for plants, plants that would normally be contained in an aquarium or, you know, suddenly showing up elsewhere, which is a problem. Um, decorative ponds and gardens. So these are the ponds and gardens already outdoors. This is the invasive ornamental issue. Um, so a lot of um, plants in particular are introduced intentionally for these decorative reasons. Um, and some of them can es actually escape that cultivation and start to show up in natural areas. And I'll mention some of those in a moment. Um, and then of course, boating and fishing. Um, that's where kind of my organization comes up in with doing the education and preventing the spread. And then of course, there's just natural ways that they spread, whether it's other you know, forms of wildlife, the wind, the water itself moving. Um, so the uh, opportunities for spread are, are quite significant here. So when we talk about the introduction of an invasive species, it's important to mention um, the, the point where we're trying to start managing them. And so this is called early detection and rapid response. It's a uh, some terms used quite readily throughout the uh, invasive species management world. Um, and it's exactly as it sounds. It means you're trying to detect an invasive species as quickly as possible and then respond as quickly as possible. So, you know, I circled there, you have a species introduced in a perfect world, you would have been able to prevent that species from being introduced at all. Um, whether it was through boat decontamination or education and somebody knew what it looked like and pulled it off a boat trailer before it could move to another lake, whatever it might be. Um, the goal is to prevent, but if you can't do that and something is already introduced, then you want to eradicate or manage the invasive species. And this is when you, you find something and the population is really small to the point where it's maybe a single organism or just a tiny population and you're able to get in there and quickly manage it and get it under control um, before it has a chance to significantly spread to other places. It takes less human power this way, it takes way less money this way, um, and so we're trying to stay at the end of this management curve here. Um, when you get to the other end of the curve, that's where things get really challenging and you start dealing with really, really long-term management and invasive species, which gets really expensive. It takes a lot of labor from people, a lot of time from people. Um, and I'm going to actually throw a couple of species names out there from, the, from land because I think most people will be familiar with like autumn olive and garlic mustard. Um, that's, those are two invasive species that I would put at the right side of this curve because they are everywhere um, and they are very difficult to manage at this point because they are everywhere. Um, and the spread is so significant that going after that, you know, you might make a small dent, but ultimately you're still going to um, have to treat for essentially years on end. So moving on, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the invasive species themselves and the ones that we manage and some that we don't currently. Some might not even be in this region yet, but I want to make you aware of them. Um, I'll be focusing on a few in particular here in a moment and, and going into more detail. But I did want to throw up some pictures of some of the, the main ones that we do talk about. So Eurasian water milfoil, I know many of you are familiar about. That's one I'll be talking more in depth on in a moment. Curly leaf poundweed, another um, aquatic invasive down there, uh, works very similar in that it grows really thick, dense mats and can take over an ecosystem. Water lettuce in the upper right, that's what I wanted to point out because um, this is one of the invasive ornamentals I mentioned that people can actually still go and buy if they want. Um, it looks, it's named for exactly why you think it looks like 
um, little um, heads of lettuce, but it actually grows on the surface of water and can completely take over. Now, the nice thing about water lettuce, I will say, is it doesn't totally love um, Michigan's cold winters. And so it's not been something that um, typically will overwinter in this region. Um, it's some, something that's spreading a lot more um, south. However, but with, you know, with climate change and our warmer winters, we are concerned that we might start to see this um, taking over in our region a bit more, or at least downstate. Uh, flowering rush is one that we don't have in this region yet, um, but it is a shoreline species, grows a lot like its neighbor right there, purple loosestrife and other shoreline species uh, that likes really wet feet. Um, and while purple loosestrife is all over our region, it blooms in about mid-July, um, flowering rush is only as far north as Midlands that we're aware of. So that's one to be aware of um, when you're out recreating if you see something with these really unique flowers. Moving on from the world of plants, we have all sorts of different organisms here. Um, rusty crayfish, I'll be talking about another species of crayfish in a moment, but really, really voracious eaters um, and reproduces readily so it can quickly take over. I think everyone is familiar with invasive carp. Um, there's multiple carp species that we're concerned about coming into the Great Lakes. Um, the spiny water flea was, um, seems kind of unassuming because so tiny, but um, was one of those hitchhikers that came through in ballast water um, and uh, can eat a significant amount of zooplankton um, and also really can clog um, our infrastructure, which is kind of a different uh, concern that we have from the, the water flea. Sea lamprey is another uh, that I think many of you will be familiar with, just the most unattractive thing in my opinion, but um, has caused a lot of problems. It's one of the reasons for, it's a parasitic, um, lampreys are parasitic, so it'll actually latch on to other organisms um, and live off of them that way, but it was one of the reasons for uh, the trout decline initially. Um, and this is actively managed. In fact, on my drive into work today, I passed, oh, probably nine or 11 um, Fish and Wildlife Service trucks hauling trailers that had lamprey, um, lamprey management team written on the side of them. And they were um, traveling throughout Benzie and Manistee doing treatments for lamprey. Round goby. Um, I'm seeing a lot of these washing up on the beach right now, along with the alewives. This is an invasive that has been around for quite a while um, and unfortunately has kind of a constant food source in that it eats uh, zebra mussels. But uh, because there are also a lot of zebra mussels, uh, this goby is not running out of a food source really anytime soon, unfortunately. And a few more here, um, zebra and quagga mussels. Uh, Everywhere also, um, this I noticed was a main concern for many people, which understandably so. Um, they are a huge, huge issue um, for many, many reasons. And we can talk more about that here shortly. Um, another crayfish I'll talk about and the New Zealand mud snail, which I will talk about in more detail here. So I'm gonna kind of skip over this slide a bit, uh, bit quickly. So, uh, the first species I want to focus on is Eurasian water milfoil. Um, and this was a concern for many folks I noticed. Uh, and this is a state of Michigan restricted noxious weed. And I have a few kind of statements at the top of my species descriptions that I'll break down. But essentially, a restricted noxious weed means that um, it is, they're trying to prevent the movement. It's, you know, it's, it's hard because it's not, it's regulated, but it's not very well enforced, um, trying to prevent the movement of this plant from one place to another. So much like I described earlier, it grows very, very quickly, very early in the season. So it limits light availability to other organisms. Um, it is submergent, so it grows underwater and forms these really, really incredibly dense, thick mats of vegetation. 
um, which you can see, you know, it, it varies in depth, usually three to 12 feet below water. But if you have a big population of milf, uh, water milfoil, you will be able to see it, especially, if, for example, in that bottom picture, you can see that the, that population is significant and how that would affect an entire ecosystem um, for the things living there. And also say you are a boater trying to recreate in that area, it would be very, very challenging. So it's um, a little tricky to identify simply in the sense that there's also a native water milfoil, um, but essentially it is this, has the, um, the long stem with leaves coming out of it and then these little tiny what they call leaflets that whorl or kind of twist around the outside of those stems. And I'll show you kind of a close up picture of what that looks like in a moment. But this one, it, it spreads via fragmentation um, which makes it extra challenging because if you break off um, a piece of water milfoil, that gives it the ability to create an entirely new um, plant. Um, and it also um, spread, shoots out these runners that uh, allow it to spread. It doesn't spread through seed quite as much, but because it does spread through fragments and breaking off, these are the things that often um, you, can, you can tell by the tendrils how easy it would be for them to get wrapped around, say, a boat trailer that was launching a boat that, you know, comes out of the water and then maybe goes to another lake, backs in there and that um, milfoil would come off and be able to start a new plant. So this is in quite a few places in our region, um, but there are some lakes that don't have it yet. So prevention and detecting it early is really, really key um, because managing it is very long-term and expensive. And I think there are some lake association folks who could, um, unfortunately confirm that as they're living through that management process right now. So this is the quick picture I wanted to show you the comparison between the invasive and the native milfoil. You can see that they look really, really similar. Um, the invasive milfoil has that, that nine to 21 leaflets um, around the stem, while the native has typically up to nine. So it's gonna have far fewer leaflets um, also, if you were to take them out of the water, the native milfoil will stay quite rigid where the invasive milfoil will kind of, all the leaflets will kind of come together. Um, and so when you're identifying them, it often helps to A, either put them in water so you can count the leaflets or, or allow them to dry a little bit so you can see if they stay rigid. Um, but it is hard to tell um, unless you have a little bit of a trained eye for this. And so another thing I wanted to feature as I talk about some of these species more in depth is the Midwest Invasive Species Information Network. I'm sure some of you are familiar um, or MISIN, but this is a program through MSU that actually throughout the whole Midwest allows um, resource managers, but also community members and lake associations and anyone kind of with an interest in this to map where invasive species are. So, um, you know, the, it's a, an app, which I'll talk about a little later on, but also a website where you can go in and say, you know, type in, I want to know where all of the milfoil is in Benzie County, and it will bring you to a map and you can zoom in and see all of the places it's been reported. Um, and some of the reports are from conser conservation professionals out in the field and others are from community members who just had the app on their phone and were fishing, for example, and spotted milfoil and reported it into the database. Um, and it's a really, really useful tool to identify where these things are. Um, the data comes back to people like me. So if there's, you know, say a, a new species in this region that we didn't know was here, if, it, if we get an alert, we can go in and do that early detection rapid response and try and prevent the spread. Um, but you get a map like this. So this is the milfoil in Benzie County. You can see it's in a lot of places, but not every place. You know, if, if I were Lake Ann, I would be um, very concerned about this. And I know that they are because they don't have it quite yet, but there are neighboring lakes that do. So trying to wash boats, make sure that this, you know, fragments of milfoil are not getting moved from place to place. Um, and you can actually in this program click on each report and see where it was, who made the report, how large of a population it was and that sort of thing. It's a very, very cool tool to have. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. 
So the next species I want to talk about is starry stonewort. This functions very similar to um, milfoil, but it's actually um, prohibited in the state of Michigan, meaning it is truly illegal to move it from place to place. And I say this, it is truly illegal to knowingly move it from place to place. Um, you know, it is, there is a Michigan law saying people need to um, clean their boats and drain their boats before moving from place to place. Um, and then incorporated into that law are some of these prohibited species. So it's native to Eurasia. This one appears a little bit later in the summer, so it's not something that you're necessarily going to go out right now and spot. Um, and it can get quite dense by the fall. It has these really irregular branches that look like little trees um, and forms the dense mats a lot like the water milfoil does, but instead of um, being submerged potentially closer to the surface of the, of the lake, it grows along the lake bottoms um, and has these branches that go up to, you know, a couple to three feet up. Um, it can grow in extremely deep water um, and it does prefer like the slower moving or, or even completely still water. You'll see it's called starry stonewort. Um, and the picture on the upper left there, you can see a little picture um, second down from the top on the left it has these little stars. They're not true flowers. They're these little bulbs that appear at the base of the stem. Um, and that's an, you know, a really good ID. That picture is really blown up though. At starry stonewarts are the, the, these little bulbs are very, very small. So it's not always going to be the way you're going to be able to identify them. Uh, prevention and early detection is critical for this one. In Northwest Michigan, we only have one population that we're aware of. I'll show that map in a second. Um, but boats are the primary method of transport for this one. Um, and so again, that's why awareness and cleaning and drying equipment, which I'll talk about that process, um, can really, really help stop the spread, especially if we know where it already is. So unfortunately, I'm going to put a little highlight on Manistee County here. Um, and the one population that we're aware of in this region is on Portage Lake. This was identified, <coughs> I'm trying to think if it was last year or the year before, very recently in just the last couple of years. Um, and, you know, immediately addressed because it was identified. And this is an example of where that early detection rapid response really comes into play. Because this is one that you just, much like the water milfoil, you don't want to start having appear in all of these different uh, lakes that we have in our region. So Didymo, or rock snot, as it's wonderfully named, is the next species I want to highlight. Um, this one is detected in Michigan, and most recently it's been in the news quite a bit because it's been in the upper Manistee River, which is a little outside our service area, but you know, those boundaries of our service area are quite arbitrary. You know, rivers and lakes cross these boundaries that we make up as people, um, and so we're still very concerned about it. Um, and it's one we're keeping an eye on, but there's been a lot of really good educational resources about it, um, which is wonderful to see. So this is actually a freshwater algae. It's native to northern regions, including um, possibly some northern regions of North America. You don't often see invasive species that can be um, invasive from areas that close. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm dealing with some allergies right now. Um, but this actually produces these stalks and, you know, it, it gets its name obviously from how it looks, but it doesn't act, it, it feels like wet wool or I've heard people describe it as like wet cotton balls, um, if you were to actually feel it. And it can actually get grow in small clumps or these tendrils that appear in it and it does prefer slightly flowing water. Um, so you'll see these tendrils kind of flowing with the water as well. Um, in, <laughs> My apologies. And unlike some of the other algaes that you'll see in freshwater, like the red or green, it does not necessarily indicate a lowering of the water quality that you might see with like an algal bloom. Um, and this is a really interesting point. You know, it, it causes, it has its own reasons for concern, like by altering the habitat and food sources for fish. But as far as the actual quality of the water, um, scientists are still studying that impact because it doesn't seem, luckily, to be as significant as some of those blooms that um, we have to deal with elsewhere. <coughs> so this is a picture of where um, 
According to Missin, where the Didymo has been identified so far, you can see that it's on the upper Manistee right around Kalkaska. There's a few outlying populations, um, but it is getting identified a little bit more now. You know, there was just the one population, then there was another one, and then a couple more. Um, and that's kind of the spooky thing when you start to see things spreading that way. So we're very, very much looking out for that this, um, this summer, more so than we ever really have in the past. Um, and luckily it's pretty obvious um, what it looks like, um, but there are some lookalikes. So, um, you know, if you're not sure, if you spot something like this in the region this summer, you can always ask a, a resource professional for a second opinion. And I'll talk about reporting them too in a bit more. We're in depth here in a moment. So New Zealand mud snail is my um, one I certainly wanted to include because this is more recently identified in our region as well. This is a watch list species and a watch list species in Michigan means it's been identified as something that has the potential to significantly impact the environment. I um, mean, it, its movement is also prohibited. So there's actually two genetic types of this snail. Um, there's two clones, and the one found in Michigan is clone two. It's found in the Great Lakes region. Um, so because they're clones, the female has the ability to develop embryos without fertilization. And you can see that really astounding number there, but 40 million snails are possible from a single female. Um, I read another statistic that was in a, in a yard of water, um, there could be up to 500,000 snails. Um, and they are tiny, they're about an eighth of an inch long, but 500,000 of, of even tiny snails can be very problematic. Unfortunately, they are also pretty hard to identify. Um, I mean, it's like a little brown snail. It has the five whorls on the shell. Um, and, but because of their size, you know, that's a, pretty good indicator of what they could be. Um, they impact the food availability and, you know, things try to eat them, but they have very, very little nutritional value um, and often can go through the entire um, system of a fish and come out and still be alive. Um, so that's clearly an issue as well. And while they're super tolerant of quite a few habitats, they do prefer a really slow, constant water flow. Um, and the cleaning of equipment, the draining, and then the drying is really important because these snails can actually live out of the water for several days. And, and you know, when you think about that, it's so easy to move from place to place, especially if the, even the um, lack of water isn't slowing them down. Um, if you were to move, um, you know, from one lake and then a couple of days later, go to the next thinking you weren't moving anything because something, you know, dried for 24 hours, that might not be enough. So this is a map of where the New Zealand mud snail's been identified um, in Northwest Michigan, just a handful of populations. Um, the one south of Traverse City is in the Boardman River. Um, I was actually working at the Grand Traverse Conservation District when those were discovered. I remember they showed up in our um, staff room fridge one day waiting to get identified. Um, so that's pretty recent that those were found in this area um, and surveying is still pretty um, on, it's pretty constant and ongoing for those. Um, it's hard, they're hard to spot, but when um, Steve talked about doing that macro invertebrate survey through the conservation district that's coming up, that event he was promoting, I believe they'll be doing some surveying for the New Zealand mud snail as well. Um, but then that big, huge blob down um, east of Ludington, that's the Pier Marquette River, a lot of populations have been identified there. So clearly we're concerned about things getting transported up into our region as people move around this summer. Um, let me check my time here. <clears throat> so European frogbit is another one. Um, this was another I noticed people were concerned about. Another watch list species. Um, we're trying to make sure this doesn't spread around because it's not in our region and it's prohib prohibited, but looks very much like a small uh, water lily. You can it looks very similar, except they're quite tiny compared to water lilies. So they're only about two inches wide, um, those heart-shaped leaves that is. Um, and that really distinct um, white flower with the yellow center is another good indicator of them. They prefer pretty slow moving areas. So you'll see them in kind of um, like these inlets and lakes 
Um, and even in ditches alongside the road that might be going into a larger water body, that's where you might find European frog, but um, in much like other invasive species, they can completely take over um, entire landscapes. I've seen images from luckily not our area where the entire surface of the water is European frog pit, which we absolutely do not want in this region, um, which of course can reduce oxygen um, and light where they're very thick of too, um, as I mentioned. This one is starting to show up and move more than we even realized. Um, there's more and more reports coming through of this getting moved, uh, primarily through boats and then also through hunting in the fall when uh, more folks are out with waders um, and they're getting moved from spot to spot. So uh, we do a big push for outreach and, and prevention of this one in the fall. And so this is a picture of where European frogbit appears in Michigan, uh, mostly on the east side of the state. The Traverse City population, I believe, is a, a community submitted um, site, and I'm not entirely sure that's been confirmed yet. It's relatively recent. But as you can see on our side of the state, pretty much in the clear, and we'd like to keep it that way if we can. My last species I'm going to highlight here is uh, just to kind of diversify what I'm talking about is the red swamp crayfish. Another watch list species not in our region. Um, and, and kind of a different type of invasive. You know, I've been talking a lot about plants here um, or algae, but these ones are different in the sense that they can eat so much um, and that they can outcompete for food with other aquatic wildlife. Um, they're pretty tolerant of the various freshwater habitats that we have, but they do prefer some flowing water. Um, and again, reproduce. Um, like crazy, 500 eggs per female. Um, and if you think of that many crayfish that are able to eat that much, um, the food supply for our native wildlife is really, really gonna, it, going to dwindle. Um, and this is one that was likely introduced through that aquarium industry, um, interestingly. So this is a really good example of why we're trying to educate folks to not do that. And again, a, a, an unconfirmed um, sighting of it in Leelanau County um, but mostly downstate, um, you know, doesn't move quite as easily as some of the vegetation that um, would be considered invasive, but certainly very, very possible, which is why it's a watch list species in our region. So I'm going to shift here. Um, you know, I've highlighted some of the main invasives, but when it comes to actually preventing the spread of them, what do we do? So I'm going to really I'm going to kind of drill in this. Uh, in this graph again. So, um, you know, where things are introduced, we're trying to prevent them, but then maybe a small population has arrived and we're trying to make sure that that doesn't get worse than it already is. So what we do at the Aquatic Invasive Species Pathways Program is we have two a trailer mounted mobile boat wash units. They have, it has high pressure, hot water. Um, there's a diesel boiler um, and so, uh, water tank that we're able to use high pressure to actually wash boats. Um, and we travel to regional launches in our four county service area and we park ourselves and we stage ourselves and we try and get boaters who are going in and out of waterways to wash their boats. Um, we also do just general AIS education and outreach, trying to have a really positive interaction with folks, totally free of cost um, in preventing the spread of invasives, going to a lot of places where we know there are invasives to do that education, also staging at places where there are very few invasives, trying to catch boats that would be going in and preventing this potential spread to those relatively balanced ecosystems. So like I said, we're trying to prevent the spread of those invasive species. Um, you know, the, the act of boating and the behavior of boating is a really ingrained thing. People have the way they do it. They've been doing it for ages, which I completely understand. Um, and so the approach um, for boaters, you have to be quite sensitive and think about it as, you know, taking the time to essentially change a behavior that's been um, established for quite a while. And, and hopefully by having a positive interaction, providing positive outreach and education, you can gradually help make that behavior change become more of a permanent thing um, 
and that's why we try to get our faces and our actions out in the public as much as possible so people start to see the boat washing whether it's through us or a permanent boat wash or signage at a launch and think oh yes I need to take you know the five minutes after I boat to make sure there's nothing on my trailer or there's you know drain my live well and make sure I'm not moving anything um, essentially establishing a better water ethic. And because I always want to promote what we do, um, I am still accepting if you happen to be on a lake and want a boat wash, we're pretty much booked through July. Um, my crew's out typically Thursday through Saturdays, but I am definitely flexible in there. We have a, a three-person crew that goes out with our boat wash units and um, stages throughout the summer. So if you are interested in having um, us at your launch if you're on a lake or if you know of a lake that could really use a boat wash in a particular weekend, especially in August and September, please do let me know. There's just a really good example here on the bottom of this is a picture that was taken a couple of years ago um, of a trailer that came out of a lake and is just covered in vegetation. Um, and if this hadn't been cleaned off, easily, easily moved to a new spot. So why should you clean drain dry? It's kind of strange we get this question a lot from boaters, like how do you know this works? And it seems um, a little intuitive that you know spraying something with high pressure would help clean it, but it does help to have some supporting science there. So this is a study I always like to refer to. Um, it's actually based out of the UK, but they are dealing with their own invasive species. And this study actually um, included um, zebra mussels, so it's very relevant to our world. But the main takeaways are it, essentially that there's many vectors for AIS spread. We're aware of them over here as well. Um, our personal protective equipment, waders, boats, anything that's going in and out of the water. Um, and the high hot water, high pressure boat washing is considered a form of biosecurity. So it's kind of that extra protection of protecting the biodiversity of a region. Uh, the study also determined that duration of spray and the distance from the equipment is really important. Of course, the longer you spray, the little and the closer you are, the more effective it will be. Um, and hot water is absolutely preferred because it, it manages the most things. But if you only had um, cold water at a high pressure, you would still be able to um, eradicate some of the species that could be hitchhiking um, on a boat or trailer. So that's important too. Um, we often tell people if they can't access a boat wash to try and go through a car wash um, because sometimes it's it's something, you know, it's better than nothing. And although hot water is definitely preferred. Um, these are the areas on a boat and trailer we try and get when we do a boat wash. Um, it really only takes two or three minutes to quickly go around and wash the boat. So it's a quick stop where these folks pull onto our containment mat. We spray things really quickly um, and try and get things off. And if we do get any vegetation or organisms off, we then try to identify them um, and report them if they aren't happen to be invasive. We do get native species too sometimes, of course. Um, I did want to emphasize the drying of the clean drain dry. Such a critical step. Um, many organisms can survive in just little bits of water or completely out of water. Like I mentioned, the New Zealand mud snail can survive for a few days without water at all. Um, and so allowing recreational equipment to dry for five days, um, if you can, you know, at a minimum five days, I would, I would love if everyone could let their boat sit for 14 days to let it dry completely, but that's not realistic. And so we, we try to get people to do it for at least five days to allow for that additional layer of protection and prevention. Um, I want to mention it's really important that um, I'm not just talking about motorized boats. I've been focusing a lot on you know, boats with motors going out into waterways, but kayakers and paddle boaters can absolutely um, spread invasives as well. In this region, we have a lot of races. I'm thinking like M22 challenge and paddleboard races um, that draw hundreds of kayakers and paddleboarders to this region, often from downstate or out of state, and they can have invasive species on them. Um, and then they can come from our lakes with invasive species and go to other places. So we try and hit those events as well um, to prevent spread in either direction. Um, and also waders and fishing equipment year round have the potential to spread organisms as well. Um, 
Cleaning and drying, very important. You know, we're, we're thinking about how to incorporate some wader washing launches and access points for rivers. Um, there's something that's often overlooked and it's easy to go from place to place in them. Um, and then people fishing also have the additional responsibility to not dump a bait in the water. Um, it's actually a law in Michigan as of recently, which is, it's, which is great. Again, something regulated, but not very enforced. Um, but all bait should be disposed of on dry land or in the trash if possible. Um, you know, definitely not in the water where something could get spread. So there's a few other ways to de decontaminate if you don't have the high pressure hot water systems. Um, one is the CD3 system or something similar. This is um, one that's quite popular um, and getting more popular. And so this is actually a waterless decontamination system. Um, it uses um, air and then a vacuum system to clean. Um, and so even though it doesn't have the hot water, which we know is very effective, this has also been shown to be a very effective method for decontamination. I think I read up to 96% success decontaminating. Um, and it's often an option um, if there's a launch where if you have a water system set up over a permanent boat wash, um, where water could potentially you know, be used to spray off a boat and then run right back into the lake. Some launches are set up in that way, unfortunately. So a waterless system is the way to go. Um, and the vacuum is actually quite nice in this, in this situation because you can put it right into like a live well and get almost all of the water out, um, which is something we can't actually do when we're washing boats. Um, and then just having signage with, you know, extra rules and then some tools available for folks to get under their boats to, um, you know, pull off vegetation or scrub their boats or, um, you know, drain uh, some of the water that would be on their boat. Um, these are also useful tools, you know, it's not realistic all of the time that there's going to be um, a system like ours available. Um, and so if, like I said, anything is sometimes better than nothing. So how can you help? Um, you can clean, drain, dry. I'm just gonna keep drilling that in as much as possible, but taking the extra few minutes after recreating or going in the water is, is so, so important. And it really doesn't take long um, to do a, a vegetation check or to spray things off. And there's more boat washes becoming available in our region. So if you're near one, um, trying to find that or going through a car wash, that sort of thing. Don't transport water or live bait. You can create a decontamination kit yourself. Um, and this is a kit that you can keep on yourself. Um, there's a picture of um, a, an example of one there on the bottom, but it's basically some items that will help you clean your gear um, in the field or when you get back to your vehicle really quickly. You know, you might have a spray bottle with some bleach or 409 and some rugs and brush or rags and brushes and things like that to really clean your gear yourself without having to rely on some of the signage and tools that might be associated with the launch or access site. Drying, of course, as long as you possibly can. And then, you know, in my world, it's all about education. So sharing the news about AIS, if you've heard anything interesting in the, in the news about it, or if you've learned something really interesting or that it's in a new body of water near you, educating your neighbors and your friends and family about what they could be doing to preventing the spread as well. Um, and then of course, if you wanna volunteer at a boat wash, you're absolutely welcome. Just get in touch with me. Um, and a little reminder there at the top is don't forget winter time. Um, you know, we're, we're very focused on summer right now, especially now when it's about 90 degrees, but invasive species can absolutely still be moved in the colder months, especially when you think of um, like ice fishing, things can still get moved in that way. And so a lot of these same rules still apply. And I have just a little bit left. I know I'm getting close to my time here, but um, another thing I wanted to talk about was the MyCore um, Cooperative Lakes Monitoring Program. And I know that I saw in the poll at the beginning, there's a lot of um, Lake Association folks here who are likely familiar with this. Um, but this is a program that allows uh, for community science to submit information to determine water quality on lakes that basically adopt a lake. So it's a program that's been going on for a really long time. In fact, it's one of the oldest um, volunteer monitoring programs um, 
that's been around and it's very cool that it's in our own region. Um, but like I said, it allows community members to actually monitor a lake's water quality. And so they have so many resources available, really in-depth training where you can learn about the whole process um, and then actually go out and do the, do the sampling and um, test for the water quality of the lake that you take on. And then there's a lot of assistance available and laboratory support once that data is collected. So if you're interested in taking something like that on, I have put the link here. Um, after the presentation's over in the next few days, I, I know that the Grand Traverse Conservation District is going to send a follow-up email with a lot of the links that I've been talking about, and I'll make sure that this one is included if you're interested in learning more. A few more additional opportunities, because I'm always encouraging people to get out on the water, whether it's volunteering or just doing something fun. Um, participate in a boat wash, try and get that in as much as, uh, as possible. Um, Steve already talked about the bugs don't bug me macroinvertebrate survey opportunity through the conservation district, but it's up there again if you didn't catch it the first time. And then my own conservation district, Benzi CD, um, we have the Platte River Clean Suite coming up in July, so about a month away. Um, and this is actually a river cleanup, so it's not quite invasive species related, but we will have a boat wash there. So if you're interested in seeing what that's all about, please do stop by. And it's also just a really fun day to get out and do a river cleanup. Um, and we will undoubtedly find a way to incorporate invasive species at some point, but it's a really beautiful time to get out and explore the river. And so, um, Kind of my final thing I wanted to talk about here is actually reporting invasive species. So like I mentioned, it's a really critical component of early detection and rapid response. Um, you know, there's only so many people out in the field looking for these things. And, and while there's a, a good support of resource managers doing this work, we do often rely on just the knowledge of community members who are aware and going out and thinking, oh, this doesn't seem quite right, or I've never seen this plant or this animal here. I, I think this might be an invasive. Um, just paying attention to that sort of thing and then letting someone know about it to either confirm or deny. Um, and it's great if we can say, hey, that's totally normal. That's a native, you know, it's it's not an issue, but sometimes it's like, oh wow, that's that one population of starry stonewort on Portage Lake, and then you can contain it quite quickly. So you can notify the DNR Eagle. Um, you can contact me directly or your local CISMA. So the CISMA stands for a Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area. And they typically work um, with plants that are found on land, but they do quite a bit of management of the shoreline species and some of the ones I talked about. So um, like Phragmites and Purple Loosestrife, those plants, um, they'd be really good ones to contact um, for those species. And I'll put the contact information, or I have put the contact information for our local CISMA at the end of this presentation. And of course, I talked about MISIN, that Midwest Invasive Species Information Network, but I do really encourage you to check it out if you're interested in doing this kind of reporting in the field. Um, it is an app, a really nice one you can put right on your phone. That's a picture of what it looks like, that MISIN app. Um, but beyond reporting, it's really good too because it just has species identification modules. You can go through kind of this quiz to help you learn your species. You can just pull up a species and see a bunch of pictures of it. Like I want to know what um, European frog bit looks like. I can't quite remember. You can type it in and it'll, it'll show you a lot of pictures, which is great for in the field if you're not sure what you're looking at. You can look at those maps of the outbreaks to help guide you. Um, and it actually uh, links directly to that um, Cooperative Lakes management program I talked or monitoring program I talked about through the Aquatic Plant Watch. So everything's kind of connected, which is nice. And on that note, I was talking really quickly because I know that I'm getting close to the end of my time and I want to leave some room for questions here. Um, but ultimately, we're all working together to preserve this really, really stunning, healthy habitat that we have in Northwest Michigan um, and beyond because um, I know for one that I appreciate this area we live in so much and um, I've been a little, it, it's hard working with invasive species because you see them all the time, um, but I also think it helps you really appreciate when you come upon a really balanced healthy ecosystem and, and hopefully the goal is to get, you know, places back to that, um, that level all over the place. 
So with that, there's a list of some resources I think would be useful if you're interested in this subject. They can go in that follow-up email as well. Um, otherwise, my contact information is right there. Please feel free to reach out at any time if you have questions. I've also put Audrey Meninga's information there. She's the coordinator of the Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network. So more of the land and shoreline species management, um, but also a really, really good resource as well. And I think, yeah, Steve's I think is taking over to do some of the Q&A if there are any. Uh, thank you, Emily. Excellent, excellent presentation. Great information. And uh, thank you very much. Um, I think we got a majority of our questions answered. Uh, one okay. was, uh, can uh, Didymo or rocks not uh, invade inland lakes or do they just rivers and streams? And uh, basically it's primarily uh, cold water, flowing water rivers. Uh, they can live between, I guess, 39 and 60 deg degrees Fahrenheit. So it's pretty cold environment and you don't find those kind of lakes around our neck of the woods, maybe in Canada, more Northern climates. Can you address that anymore? No, I think you pretty much summed it up. You know, I didn't talk about this too much, but there are some other populations of Didymo in Michigan, but they are in the upper peninsula in areas that are going to be significantly colder. So that is one some, something that's working a little bit in our advantage in this region is that we don't have um, quite the best habitat for them, but um, clearly some habitats are coming through, so it's still important to keep an eye. But yeah, they, it definitely prefers the this moving water of some sort as well. And then uh, another one about uh, New Zealand mud snails, and uh, they can, from what I understand, uh, live in an inland lake. Uh, any further information on those? Um, no, again, you're, you, Steve, you might actually know more about New Zealand mud snails than I do. Um, but no, my understanding is they, they're pretty tolerant of multiple habitats. I mean, a lot of these invasive species have preferences, like you're more likely to find them in certain places, but that doesn't mean that they can't be found in other places, um, which is why keeping your eyes open all the time is so, so important. Yeah, you're exactly right on those things. Uh, they moved into the boardman, were introduced, they were found in 2012, and they've just, you know, their numbers are now in millions. There's millions yeah. of them. And, uh, uh, you know, they, fish will eat them, uh, you know, but uh, they can't digest them because of the hard uh, uh, casing. And so uh, it'll go through their body and uh, they'll feel full, but they're not getting any nutrients from them. So it's that that's a big issue here now that's emerging locally that uh, we got to keep a close eye on to see how that's going to affect our aquatic uh, yeah. food chain. Yeah, that's hard. It's hard to know, especially when it's going to be such an fish will think it's the thing to go for because there's so many of them. So yeah, that's that's always tough to see that sort of thing developing. And then uh, Ralph, uh, said that uh, Chinese mystery snail was found in Rennie Lake, uh, was probably introduced via an aquarium, uh, aquatic garden industry. So that's one I had never heard of. So that's, uh, you can keep it, Ralph. We don't want it. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I'm not as familiar with that too. The aquarium industry is really interesting. I don't know, a couple of years ago, again, with pandemic time, I'm getting thrown off, but there was a lot of news stories about like the aquarium um, moss balls that were um, contaminated with zebra mussels that people that had been shipped out. Um, and there was, everyone was on high alert because uh, these things had the potential to get dumped and there were these invasive species in them. So um, I'm glad, you know, definitely for folks interested in that, check out the Ripple program because that's what they do exclusively. Awesome. Um, Ralph also asked, um, drying is part of the clean drain dialogue, uh, clean drain dry uh, dialogue. However, uh, drying is not a legal requirement for mm -hmm. AIS control in Michigan. Should the law be amended to include drying? Um, you know, from my perspective, I, I think certainly, you know, the current law states that once a boat is trailered, the, the trailer and boat must be free of all vegetation and, and everything must be drained. Um, 
Yeah, but the drying is such a critical part, especially since we know that things can live out of water for quite a while. Um, you know, it's so hard to enforce those things, but sometimes just having a law in place and having signage that it's a law can be enough for push people to take that extra step to think about it. So personally, yes, um, uh, I'm, I'm all for trying to, you know, get people to go that extra step to prevent the spread. I uh, attended a, uh, a seminar the other day on rock snot, and it was interesting that uh, drying does not isn't as effective as using a detergent, uh, you know, like a dish soap, in spraying your uh, your waders. Um, I found that very interesting to you know say that drying because they could survive you know, out of water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that is a. I, I should point out that webinar. Was that the Not My Species webinar, Steve? Yeah, if, if folks are interested in learning more about Didymo there, um, or other invasive species in, in general, the state has a really good series called Not My Species, um, the, the my being MI as in Michigan. Um, and I highly recommend it because they have some great information on ongoing invasive species issues as well. Well, thank you once again, Emily, and I'm going to turn it over to Carol and uh, for some closing comments. Carol. Oh, Carol, you're muted, I think. Okay, hello. <laughs> I was unmuted originally. <laughs> um, so good evening, everyone. I'm Carol Kusel. I'm a founder and organizer of this poll series. Boy, that was a very comprehensive review of how to spot and stop and then report the current most unwanted aquatic invasive species in Michigan. Not only did Emily Cook informed us, she did so with captivating visual slides. I'm sure your visual memory will help you as you go out and look for these things. Thank you, Emily, for your detailed work and fantastic presentation. Really appreciate your work. I also extend thank yous to our host and facilitators, Steve Largent and Allie Hertmer, Hetmer, excuse me, from the Grand Traverse Conservation District. Without the Conservation District's support, along with Steve and Allie's work, you likely wouldn't have even heard about this presentation. And quite frankly, we simply wouldn't have been able to hold it. Steve and Allie will continue to work after tonight. As Emily mentioned, they will be sending out an email with additional information about this topic, including so many of those links that Emily has shared with us, as well as the link to a recording of tonight's presentation. If you go to that link, you'll also find recordings of the six previous polls presentations for your additional viewing, if you so choose. Those were mentioned by Steve earlier during the introduction. Our team tonight hopes we've met the primary goals of the polls team of the polls series. First, we hope we've provided you with helpful science-based information that is expanded your understanding of at least one aspect of the intricate and at times delicate, delicate interconnection between water and land ecosystems and the people that live and play within them. And then secondly, we hope that you've been motivated to take at least one action to help protect Michigan's waters. In particular, tonight we hope you take actions to spot, stop and report AIS, whether it's small, like the New Zealand mud snails that Emily told us about, or the larger, more obvious ones like the mats created by the Eurasian water mill foil, or anything in between. Emily gave us a number of actions, actions that we could do. Some other things you could consider in your actions is taking the extra time to decontaminate your boat and gear after recreating on the water, learning more about AIS, looking for it and reporting it when, when found, sharing your knowledge with others, including your family, your friends, your neighbors, 
your lake associations, and even your local and state government officials, and then encourage them to take actions to protect Michigan waters. Share the link of this recording with them. And as Emily said, contact her at the Benzie Conservation District or any other mobile boat wash group in the state and schedule a visit to your favorite waterway. Make a contribution to the Grand Traverse Conservation Districts for its continued support of the poll series and the other good work it does. In closing, here's a takeaway for tonight. In his famous book, Walden, Henry David Thoreau wrote, we need the tonic of wilderness. We need the tonic of wilderness. I believe that those of us gathered tonight might agree that we need the tonic of Michigan's pure waterways. And because we need that tonic, we're motivated and willing to take actions to protect them. I hope you agree with me. Thanks for attending. Now go and enjoy and support your favorite lakes and streams. Thanks everyone. See ya.